a very good morning to you. Nice to have you here, particularly you're visiting HTC. Great to have you here. And what a question. How on earth do you get your priorities right? And we've had to test that this week, haven't we? You know, you're donning your woolly hats and your scarves and your warm gloves. Well, no more. 12 degrees today. Isn't that a treat? Lovely. Uh, but all sorts of priorities we've got, whether that's keeping warm, whether that's the kids' education, whether it's that applying for that job or just holding down a job, whether that's that family issue to resolve, all sorts of priorities on our desk that need to be rearranged and put in some sort of order. Um, and I guess for some of us, it'll be health, uh, top of the list. So, in fact, those are the words of advice from one CEO. This is Stephen Bartlett. You might have seen uh, on Dragon's Den. It was Gary Neville this week with him. But CEO, podcast guy, Stephen Bartlett says this. He says, my health is my first foundation. My health must be my first priority every day, forever. By embracing this reality, my life is extended so that I can enjoy all my other priorities, my dog, my partner, my family, even more. (laughs) I love the order there. The dog, (laughs) gosh, it must be a lovely dog, golden retriever or something, I don't know. But um, all sorts of things. But you might resonate with that, that health is an issue for you, physical or mental. It has just been Blue Monday, just gone, and all sorts of battles we might face on our health. But on the podium of priorities, there'll be other things competing for one, two, and three. But of course, as ever, in his word, God takes us deeper. He gets below the podium to see what the foundations are to our hearts. He wants to expose and reorientate the compass of our hearts again and again, because those are the things that shape us, the priorities that flesh out in our lives. And actually, we could go to the Bible in all sorts of places in the Bible to, to ask that question, where do I go to sort out my priorities? I wonder where you'd go. Well, as I've been mulling on it the last week or two, I've been thinking, hmm, why don't we go to the Ten Commandments? <laughs> they're there, a bit left field, but they're literally left here. Most churches have them at the back the Ten Commandments, those priorities, ten priorities the Lord gave to his people through, uh, through Moses at Mount Sinai, perhaps 1500 BC. And actually, we'll have our reading of them in just a moment from Rachel. But, but what's interesting about those commandments is that they were typical of that period in the ancient Near East. If you go to the British Library, you can go and find sort of concrete blocks with create, uh, sort of um, engravings of similar treaties where a dominant sort of king would take under his wing a, a lesser clan and he would set out his credentials and set out the terms of the treaty and in response they would show their allegiance to him. They'd be loyal to him in protection and blessings and benefits would come from coming under him and his rule. Well, so too here, actually, in Exodus 19 and 20, we have the Lord setting out his credentials. He says in 19, you know what? You're in Egypt. I'm going to, in fact, I know I have. I've rescued you from Egypt, and you are now my treasured possession. I'm going to love you and keep you. I'm going to carry you on eagle's wings, he says in Exodus 19. Not because they've been very good boys and girls. No, because he loves them. And it's in response to that love, that grace, that the commandments come. That's always the dynamic in the Christian life. The grace of the Lord only then comes our response of grateful, loving obedience. And it is love that is the, the, the response he calls from us, like a husband and a wife exchanging vows of love to each other. And it's fact how Jesus summed up the law in Matthew 22. Perhaps you might remember these are the words Jesus says. <clears throat> Summing up, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This, this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love is the heartbeat behind all these priorities that we're looking at this morning. Love, you know, that, that desire to do good for the good of the other. Not what are you get out of it, but for their good. So as we have them read now from Rachel, would you hear them, not as a list of rules to obey, first and foremost, but actually a rule of life, no, a rule of love from the ruler of love. So let's listen to them. So Rachel, do you want to come up? And if you turn to Exodus 20, you'll find um, these great priorities. And as you have them read to us, uh, imagine too the, what that would look like, the, the, the flourishing that would look like in your workplace, at your home, if, these, if we lived by these commands, priorities. Thanks, Rachel. And God spoke all of these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. 
you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, or his servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You, oh dear, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, um, you're my donkey. I don't want anyone looking at my donkey in my garden after that uh, verse and um, coveting the donkey in my garden. But funny old list. They sound out of date, don't they, in some ways, and yet they're timeless. And what we'll see three things the mor- this morning are these priorities, they, they give us a compass, a compass that's been set for us. They're a mirror that, that show us something about ourselves. And they're also making us lean, uh, yearn for a keeper, a keeper of these laws. So we've already prayed, so we'll dig straight in to this thought that these commandments, these priorities show us firstly the compass, the compass of God, that God sets the priorities. Because that's what they are, if you look at verse 1, they are from God. Verse 1, God spoke all these words. These are laws that aren't first and foremost man-made from uh, a particular time or place as if we can vote on them, you know, like the Rwanda bill, yes or no, shall we have it? No, these are laws from above. They're God-made, not man-made. And therefore they transcend time and space and all cultures because they come from the unchanging character of God who transcends different times and spaces and cultures. And, and he's the one who sets, if you like, this moral compass. In, in, the, in the grain of creation, there's a sense of right and wrong. And we all know that, this sense of a moral compass. And in fact, that's the phrase um, Matthew Paris has used in the Times a couple of weeks ago. Matthew Paris, that atheist journalist, amazing writer in the Times, he, he has a fascinating piece asking, where does this moral compass, innate moral compass, come from? Who set it? And he says, even to ask the question, well, we're bred to ask the question, just like a retriever is bred to fetch a bird. The dog will end up chasing sticks, bulls, anything, unaware of why he should fetch, but aching to fetch anyway. We humans cannot help seeking a supreme being, an ultimate master. We ache to bow the knee. We are retrievers aching for the ultimate stick. Gosh, the depths of Mr. Paris in his writing, aching to bow the knee, all of us, he says. And what's intriguing as you read that article as he goes on, His answer to where this sense of a moral compass comes from is the supreme being of natural selection. He ends up saying it's evolution that's given us this this inner sense of right and wrong priorities. Fascinating argument if you follow it. Interesting responses to it. But the commandments, the priorities here in the Bible as a whole show us actually... It's not biology that explains that moral compass. No, it's theology. It's the one who sets the moral compass as an expression of his own perfect character of love. That's where it comes from, this innate sense of right and wrong. Because you and I, whether we're a Christian or not, we have been made in God's image. And that compass is there within us. You you can't get around it. You can't get under it. It's there in all of us. However much we might ignore it or suppress it or try and change the compass points. And we know what it's like, don't we, to have a, an innate moral compass. Think of some of your kids or grandkids. When you're in the uh, Sainsbury's and there's a nice chocolate bar that you've said no to and they look behind and they put it in their bag. <laughs> <Do> they... <coughs> Excuse me. They look behind. They try and cover it up with a cough, you know. They do all that sort of thing. And they do that not just because you train them that's wrong, but because... They know in their bones that that is wrong because God himself is the generous giver and he said 
do not steal. That's wired into us. Or think of the heartbreak this week, the, the scandal of the post office, where we've seen lie after lie. And the reason that grates against us so much is because God is a God of ultimate truth who loves what is right and fair and true. And that's why he said, do not lie. Or perhaps closer to home, think of that, think of that heartbreak and agony in family life or in marriage life when there's betrayal or a drift. Well, that hurts so much because God is a God of utter, loyal, faithful, passionate love for his bride, his church, his people. And that is why he said, do not commit adultery. This moral compass, it's, it's so beautifully set because the one who said it is beautiful. This Lord of love, this, this, isn't, this isn't onus, this isn't restrictive, as David Bennett will show us in a couple of weeks. This is for our flourishing. Me at home, at work, with family, with friends at work in London. These are great priorities if we set them like this. And they show us, they point us to the character of our true north, God himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so can I say, firstly then, on this compass point, there might well be some of us here who are just looking into the Christian faith, and, and it's really good to have you. Thank you so much for coming. It, it, it might be you can relate to what Matthew Paris says about that ache, and you run after stick after stick, there's fetch and fetch and fetch, and yet you get it, and yet you still find the aches there. We can't have the ache satisfied. Well, um, it's into that ache that God, Father, Son, and Spirit speaks. It might be you want to come to Alpha as we start it again on Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening, to see how the Christian faith speaks into that ache, how it begins in this life to satisfy that ache. And for all of us, if we trust in Christ, one day we'll fulfill it perfectly when we see him face to face. So that's the first big thing, the, the compass. That's what these priorities show us. The compass that has been set by the maker of the compass. Compass. Secondly, mirror. <laughs> a mirror. What's so lovely about these um, priorities is that they don't just give us the pointer. What's actually very challenging is that they're, they're like a mirror that you, you look into. And it shows you not just the good, but the bad and the ugly. You know that feeling, don't you, of looking in the mirror? <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit rude. But um, you know that. I remember when I was, oh, it was my 30th birthday, oh, all those years ago. And um, I was walking to church, not here. And uh, uh, my friend, uh, Wakako, she knew it was my birthday. I said, happy birthday, Ed. And she sort of stared at me for a moment. And she pointed at me like this and sort of laughed. I was like, what are you laughing at? It's my birth. And she said, look in the mirror. So we went to the car mirror. There was a car there. Looked in the reflection. I was like, what's, what's the issue? And she looked closely. <laughs> like Simba. Uh, looked closely. And it was a grey hair. She was in hysterics that on my birthday, she'd spotted a grey hair. So I, 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 I dutifully sprinted to the toilet. No, I, I calmly walked, unfazed by this accusation. And I, I, I carefully extracted that grey hair. Some of you can relate to that, perhaps. But actually, Proverbs tell us the grey hairs crown of splendour. So well done. Don't pull it out. But that's what mirrors do. They show you the good, but the bad and the ugly. And it's tempting to come to the commandments, the priorities, with a sort of fleeting glance. You know, they're on the back. Um, yep, yeah, murder. I'm okay on that front. Uh, stealing. Okay, yep. Yeah, tax returns. All fine. My accountant's doing that. All fine. But Jesus... He will not let us give a fleeting look. He wants us to go deeper. And it's as you go deeper, it, it's when it really gets challenging. Because in Matthew 5, we have Jesus, as it were, speaking as he did through Moses, uh, to Moses, not just on Mount Sinai, but thousands of years later on the Sermon on the Mount. And there he shows us not just the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, what lay behind it and beneath it and empowers it. He shows us new depths. So that command, for example, not to murder. You flick ahead to Matthew 5. Jesus says, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say, if you're angry in your heart, you've committed murder. Jesus, he, he goes deeper. 
He won't let us be comfortable with a glance at the mirror thinking we're okay. How many of us, as we look at the week, just go on? The anger, the bitterness, the frustration, the resentment, the just annoyance that we barely acknowledge. And yet Jesus sees that the seeds of anger, that person on the tube, that colleague, that family member, that anger. And Jesus says, whether, whether you express it in cold indifference or a hot temper or just passive aggressive, I see that anger. And that is, that is a break of my priority that you don't murder. Or that commandment not to commit adultery. We think many of us, um, okay, okay, fine, yep, fine. But Jesus, again, Matthew 5, he says, if you look at someone with lust, in your heart you've committed adultery. Gosh, that's another hurdle we fall up, fall before again and again. And Jesus takes us then from the letter to the spirit of the law. And that is a work of his love that he shows us what's in the mirror. Not that we might wallow in it, but that we might deal with it, take out the gray hair in a way that only he can. Because that is, of course, what the first commandment is all about. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the issue of the heart because we've all got loves in our heart. All sorts of things, the passions and priorities in our heart are all mixed up. It was Augustine who said, our heart's loves are disordered. That's what it is to be human and we all know that to some degree. See that commandment not to have any other gods Well, if that's number one in place, number one on the podium, loving God, if that's to be the priority, when everything else should fall into place. But the problem is there's other things competing on the podium. In my heart and in your heart, every day, that is normal. And so look how we see that unfold in Exodus. Just a couple of pages later, these dear people of the Lord, they've heard, don't have another God before me. And yet, what do they do? They get all their gold, they melt it down, and you know what? They're going to make it into a golden cow, and they bow down before it and worship. So Matthew Paris was right, is right. We are all aching to bow the knee to something or to someone without fail. And I guess it won't be a golden cow for us, but it will be something golden, in our hearts that that glistens. But all that glistens is not gold, as Shakespeare said. I I think of um, um, a time in in, in my old law office, no, my current office, sorry, where I I sent an email. (laughs) Always a dangerous thing to do. Uh, But in this email was a lie. I lied about something to a colleague and um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't massive, it wasn't criminal. Don't, <laughs> don't phone the police, please. But I, it was a lie, and I knew it wasn't true, but I said it. So that was the sin. So that was a, a breach of commandment eight. But, but that was because at my heart I was breaching commandment number one, don't have another God before me. Because in that moment, that moment where I'm tapping away and press send, at that moment, my God was 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 my status. I wanted to be well thought of by my colleagues, to look like I know what I was doing. Do, 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 do. That was what's driving me. That was my first love at the moment. And so long before I committed breach of commandment eight, I'd breached commandment one in my heart. There's always something on the pedestal, podium number one that we put, that drives these other things. There's no point just dealing with the individual sin. We need to go deeper to the love that's driving that. That's what Augustine's getting at, these disordered loves. And there will be all sorts of things for you and me, all of us this morning, competing on that podium place. Be all sorts of things. It could be that relationship that you just need to sort out and fix, and yet you just can't let go of it, whatever it is. It could be, it could be that money and the savings and the security that that provides to your soul. It could be the job promotion and just the glitzy lights of what will come from that that grabs our hearts. It could be, actually, just the desire to be useful. Uh, That struck me this week. Uh, I was reading a letter by John Newton, you know, the 18th century pastor. And he said in retirement, he says, looking back, the idol of usefulness 
was the last idol to fall in his heart. You know, that sense in which I want to be productive and useful and make a difference and make an impact on the world. You know, good stuff. (laughs) And yet, Newton realized, even in his Christian service and ministry, he was putting busyness for the Lord ahead of intimacy with the Lord. Gosh, that was convicting. There'll be something for all of us on the podium. And so that's why we're shown the, the mirror of the law. The mirror is meant to lead us, not to wallow, sort of, or smashing the mirror in anger or chucking away the compass. No, the mirror is there to lead us to the mercy of the Lord. In fact, that's always been the teaching of the Church of England. In the old book of Common Prayer, we confess, we say, we've followed too much the desires and devices of our own hearts. And then in the communion service, after each commandment is read, every eight o'clock Sunday service in there, after each commandment is read, we say these words, Lord, have mercy on us and write these laws upon our hearts. This is a look in the mirror but to drive us to the mercy that we need. I wonder, let's take a moment just to pause before we move on. What may the Spirit be just putting his loving finger on in your heart, in your life, that actually that is the thing that's been giving you a a security and identity, a satisfaction rather than the Lord who made you. Just take a moment. And then in a second, we'll say these together, these words. Well, it's good to see these things. It reminds us we're all in the same boat. There's no superstars. This is a daily battle. So why don't we say these words together? Lord, have mercy upon us and write all these laws upon our hearts. Amen. It's got a full stop at the end, but really it should be a comma or a semicolon because if we stopped there, uh, it'd be quite a depressing morning, (laughs) wouldn't it? (laughs) You wouldn't skip out of church. You'd sulk out of church, I suspect, because we've, we've seen the compass, we've seen the mirror, but we need to see the keeper, the keeper of the law of these priorities, the one who alone can reset our priorities And that's what he does. That's our third and final point, the law keeper. Because you see, the answer, if we see ourselves rightly in the mirror, the answer is not, okay, right, Ed, HTC, let's do this. Come on. Let's let's put God number one. Everything else can be in the right place. You do this. Come on. Let's put him first. Some of us might be feeling like that. That's our um, knee-jerk reaction. Okay, there's a problem. I'm going to fix it. Put him first. (laughs) But that's not going to work. I can't change my heart by telling my heart to put God first. That's, not, that's, that's just religion. That's legalism. That, I need a power from outside. And so do you. And that is just what we're given. It's so easy in the Christian life, isn't it, to, to have that sense of resolve. Right, okay, like a game of snakes and ladders, right? Here's my ladder. Treat these commandments like a bit of a ladder. I'm going to put my ladder against the right wall. Yeah, no, I've, I got it on the wrong wall, but now I'm going to put it on the right wall. Hmm. You put it up against, and you climb, 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 climb. Yeah, I'm going to smash it and get to the 100 square at the top of the snakes and ladders board. Yeah, I'm going to do this. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't work. It's no good living like that. We, can, we can't, not from the heart. So I was talking to someone this week, and she was saying with such honesty, she was saying, in my heart, I feel like there's a scorecard before God, and every day I'm getting a mark out of 10. And on a good day, when I feel I've done a good day, I'm eight, nine, maybe nine and a half. And she senses the Lord's smile, and she's up the ladder, climbing up the rungs, and it's, it's good. But then a bad day comes, and it's not a smile, but a frown she gets, and the scorecard is low. And so she comes, not up the ladder, but down the snake to the bottom. And it's another day to start at the bottom and climb again and again and see how far she gets. And some of us, we might have been in church for years, but can relate to that feeling of climb, 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 oh, slip to, as if that's what's going to get our priorities right. But into that, it's as if Jesus 
chucks the ball game off the table. He is one who comes down the ladder for you and for me. That is what Jesus says in Matthew 5. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He's the one who obeys these temporalities to perfection. He dots every I, he crosses every T, and not just superficially, externally, but from the depths of his heart. He's one who doesn't just keep the letter of the law, but the spirit. So there's never been a moment's lust, just pure love, willing the good of the other. There's never been a second of greed in his heart, just a heart of generosity. This is one who's kept the law perfectly in a way we could never try for a moment. That's why he came down the ladder, to live that life. And as he came down the ladder, there's not just Mount Sinai that God came to to give the compass of the law. There's not just the Sermon on the Mount where he gives the mirror of the law, but there's Mount Calvary where upon himself he takes the curse of the law. All the ways your heart and mine has been disordered and had the wrong priorities, Jesus Christ takes that wrong scorecard off you and he gives you his perfect 10 out of 10. The relief that comes, that you don't have to climb the ladder. <laughs> He's come down for us. And he rose again, of course, having crushed the, the serpent, the sin, and the death of the snake. He climbs up the ladder to the finish line, and he takes us with him the moment we attach to him by faith. It's all down to him and his great, mighty battle-fighting skills. And that changes everything. Suddenly, what could become slavery to laws becomes sonship. You're in the family. That's just what William Cooper, the 18th century Puritan, friend of Newton, said in this old hymn. To see the law by Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. Beautiful, aren't they? And I don't know about you, but I know if I sat in the truths of that hymn day by day, even this week, my, my soul would soar. But more than that, my priorities would change. It just would. Because I'm centering afresh on the love of Christ for me that puts all other loves in their rightful place. Because this is one who doesn't just give us his son and his scorecard, but also his spirit. As we draw to a close, this spirit is the one who, as we prayed, he does write his law upon our hearts. Ezekiel 36 promised that. That this law, these words, not just ink on wood, but truths on your heart that change you and get into your bloodstream and change your priorities day after day, day after day, for which we need Christian community. It's not just a private thing, but it's him, God the Spirit, who does that reworking of our hearts, the reordering, the reprioritizing. It's not just sort yourself out. It's him in love sorting us out. So that is the glorious way, I think, <laughs> I've come in my conclusion to, <laughs> in my thinking in all this, that getting our right priorities, yes, there's stuff to do, yes, there's stuff to move on the table, on the, on the desk, but... There's a desk to make sure that it's in place right and it's knowing in your heart ever more deeply day by day that scorecard that Christ gives, the power of the Spirit that he's delighted to give us, the reordering that he's thrilled to work about in us. And so Stephen Bartlett, that CEO bloke, he talked about embracing health, physical health and making that his first foundation every day, forever. In contrast... The CEO of history and of the universe. Well, he makes his priority you and me, his people, his bride. And we don't embrace physical health. He embraces us every day, forever. It is his sheer grace that, that grabs us. And it is knowing the strength of his grabbing and embracing of us. That and that alone has got the power to reorder our priorities from the heart and then in our lives. So that's the prayer, isn't it, for this 
Sunday morning, oh Jesus, come and show me again the depths of your mercy and please rewrite your laws in my heart.